and welcome to the Husha Cyber Seminars Conference Call. My name is Tom and I'll be your coordinator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listening-only mode. We will conduct a question and answer session toward the end of this conference. If at any time during the call you require assistance, please please star followed by zero, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. And I'd like to turn the call over to Mr. John Duncan, Program Manager. Please proceed, sir. Thanks, Tama, and welcome, everyone, to today's cyber seminar. I know it's a hectic time in the semester, so we appreciate you making it out for it. We're very happy to have John Selker with us today. So this is the eighth semester we've been running these. This semester we've had uh, some more problems in terms of lineup than others, but if you have any technical problems today, uh, you can send a uh, chat to me using the chat box in the lower right-hand side of, of the uh, interface there. And then any feedback afterwards, we're always eager to get, and those can be addressed to us at commanager at kawazi.org. If you have any problems with the web portion of the, the presentation itself today, it can be downloaded from the Kawazi website with the URL there. So this being the last formal uh, seminar of the semester, I just wanted to point out that we're going to try and change things around a little bit in the fall and have a theme running throughout the entire semester with an average of about four to six talks uh, per semester, and that's going to start off in the fall. So at this point, I would like to introduce John. Professor Stelker is a, a professor in biological and ecological engineering at Oregon State University in Corvallis. He has his bachelor's in physics from Reed College and both master's and PhD in ag engineering from Cornell. With over 90 publications and a recent sabbatical to Switzerland, uh, it's given John the experience to not only have uh, some great coffee and chocolate, but also some exciting new sensor technologies, which he's going to talk about today. And I'd like to take a minute to thank John for being a tireless champion for hydrologic measurements in general and then uh, helping Kawazi from the start. So at this point, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you a lot, John. Um, well, it's really great to be here, and thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. Um, this talk really uh, came about, in my mind, uh, when someone asked me from the NSF uh, maybe seven years ago, is there anything that's going to be transformative in hydrology? Are there any measurements we can't make now that we will be able to make in the future? What's going to change hydrology from a perspective of, of measurements? And that really... Um, keyed me into the notion that uh, there were huge opportunities and that, and that it was poorly understood. And so kind of almost in that, um, it, with that as an incentive, I've been looking around for cool technologies to demonstrate some of the um, potential that is out there that maybe is not widely recognized. And then also um, hoping that uh, some of these uh, innovations and, and, and new applications will take root in the community um, directly. And then also to argue that we do really need an instrumentation facility to help people in general to do a much better job. Um, and so the overall message here is that uh, we've got a, a really bright future ahead of us and kind of give you a little insight into the way I see um, this instrumentation going. So I want to introduce some important technologies and stimulate you to dream and maybe give you a little bit of guidance on how you might dream. So we uh, all know that, uh, that new measurements have transformed science, but really, if you look back at the history of science, um, the progress is, is simply lockstep with observation. Uh, there are great theoretical advances as well that were important, but in almost every case, max, from Maxwell's equations and beyond, um, the observations drove new theory. Uh, looking more specifically in the hydrologic regime, Kirchner and his, uh, his team um, said a very similar thing, that, that new measurements with uh, better scale, precision, and frequency um, are almost guaranteeing us to learn new things. And Kirchner and his, uh, his colleagues then put out uh, in their paper this nice little plot showing monthly, weekly, daily um, uh, chloride concentration and contrasting that with the, uh, the, uh, the similarly observed uh, discharge. And what we see is that in the last two, the bottom two figures, the correlation between chloride and peak flow is intermittent. And so quite clearly, by having this higher resolution data, we can start to separate out many parts of the, of the hydrograph and understand parts of the hydrograph that weren't earlier understood. And so having these what we might call orthogonal data at, at high resolution completely transforms our ability to attribute 
properly, the process is giving rise to the um, flow of interest. So what are the drivers that we have uh, in hydrology? And uh, clearly, heterogeneity is a key that we all understand. And the, the key here, in my opinion, is that we, as long as we're just taking uncorrelated measurements, it all looks like heterogeneity. Until we understand the specific relationship between adjacent measurements, it all, it, we, we only deal with it in a stochastic perspective. And so we need to have measurements that respect this requirement and cross scales, not um, using different instrumentation, but single types of observations that cross many observational scales. Time is a convenient variable, um, as, as Kirchner has shown, but what can we do in terms of space? And we often uh, then turn immediately to remote sensing. And remote sensing is all fine and well, but it has some real, as we all know, limitations in terms of the ground, the, what's on the ground. Um, and, and as I showed with Kirchner's uh, uh, slide, uh, going beyond just flux, measuring flow more and more accurately and more with greater and greater um, temporal precision has a role, but quite clearly, if we are to be able to predict um, the process, uh, hydrologic uh, response under climate change, we have to actually understand the physics giving rise to that flow, not just the, the stochastic behavior, but the mechanic, the mechanisms giving rise to that flow. And to do that, we know that we need to have other measures that constrain the physics of the system, so that we might call those orthogonal dense measurements. And uh, for better or worse, and probably for worse, uh, hydrology is not a, a money-rich um, uh, subject of study, and so platinum devices are unlikely to be major players, although that, um, examples such as ENCOM do teach us that we should be comfortable asking for things that may transform our science, even if they are expensive. Now, I'm going to start with a, a fairly extensive discussion of temperature. And why is temperature a variable that I might put forward as an orthogonal measure that of interest? Well, first off, from the, and this is not telling you anything you don't know, but uh, many of the key processes that we're looking at um, are have indicators of temperature, for instance, evaporation. So here we have evaporation accounting for about half of the incident solar radiation with respect to um, energy flux. And so quite clearly, uh, there's a strong temperature signal when you remove that amount of energy from the system. So it, um, temperature provides an indicator of, of evaporation. Groundwater inflows into streams. Almost universally, the groundwater temperature is different than that of the stream, and being able to identify the, the, the changes in temperature with distance surrounding groundwater inflows, as we'll see in a few minutes, really uh, allows us to not only identify the locations of groundwater inflows, but also the temperatures of them, and then the temporal uh, behavior of those inflows. Quite clearly, solar energy is one of the main drivers of the energetics of the water cycle. So temperature is a, is a fine, you know, air temperature, for example, is a fine indicator of, of that key variable. And things such as hyperbaric exchange, where in a stream context, again, the damping of temperature will indicate quite um, the thermal inertia that the water is experiencing. And that thermal inertia then can be related to the volume um, or mass, if you will, of the material that the water is exchanging energy with. So temperature um, is, is a key player in all these processes, and uh, like uh, conservative isotopes, is a conservative tracer via the first law of thermodynamics. Quite clearly, it's not necessarily the easiest um, tracer to, uh, to keep track of because it's very slippery. It, 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 there's convection, conduction, and convection. Um, but it is conserved, and so in the end, if we have an excellent measurement of, of temperature, we have a measurement of some, uh, uh, of a, uh, that gives us insight into a conserved quantity. Okay, so um, there, now, there are certainly many exciting developments in temperature measurement. I'm just going to focus on one um, because I think it has a, a breadth of, of, of applicability that is of interest to the hydrologic community. Okay, so why are we going to look at this, um, the fiber optics here? Well, um, first thing, as I talked about earlier, we need to look at things that are inexpensive. And so if we're going to cross scales of kilometers, we need things that are going to be cost effective at a kilometer scale. And so we're looking here at something that's between 10 cents and $5 a meter. And so for um, between 100 and $5,000 a kilometer, we can install fiber optics. As I'll show you in a minute, it spans, it, it, it spans critical scales. And so we can uh, measure gradients in temperature um, from 
um, for, uh, actually less than, than centimeters up to thousands of meters. It provides us data that's continuous in space. And, um, and so not only can we take snapshots, which is commonly uh, happening with remote sensing, but we can watch transitions and evolutions of temperature in time and space. And the, the thing that I think was, to me, the biggest surprise was this business of, of the importance of precision. And we generally have temperature measurement devices that are accurate to plus or minus a half or two-tenths of a degree um, for our, our distributed sensors from onset, the hobos, for instance. Why would we possibly want a hundredth of a degree? And I'll, I'll show you in a bit several applications where a hundredth of a degree is important. But to give you the, 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 the basic message right off the bat, if you have a stream and there's a 1% increase in flow due to a groundwater input, and that groundwater input has a one degree difference from the temperature in the stream, then you're looking at a hundredth of a degree C shift from that groundwater inflow. So if you, and many, many have groundwater, have water inputs that are of the order of a few percent, so these distributed inflows. So this is where the hundredth of a degree C comes into play. And in fact, uh, we really would love to have a few more zeros in front of that decimal point. I mean, you know, so a thousandth of a degree C would just be lovely because it would allow us the ability to, to quantify inflows of even finer and finer um, levels. So how do we take the temperature with light? Basically what we have is um, uh, the scattering. So we have a frequency of injection of light into a fiber optic, and the, 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 um, the light interacts with the glass. There's a couple of ways to interact. There's first off this stuff called Brillouin scattering, and that's these things called phonons. And so there are these acoustic waves that are propagating at a characteristic velocity due to the density of the glass. If you change the density, you change the velocity, and those acoustic waves then cause Doppler shifts of the, um, of the light that's traveling in that now um, kind of uh, 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 oscillating fiber. And so there's both increases and decreases in, 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 in frequency due to those phonons. And in fact, you can measure the temperature using Brion scattering, um, and there's a company, Omnisense, which, which will sell you an instrument that does that. It also, however, is very, very sensitive to anything else that might change the density of the, of the glass, which could be, for instance, pressure. Now, this is a good thing and a bad thing. If we can see a change in pressure, could we not then have a device which measures both the stage of the river and the temperature of it? This may be considered to be almost a holy grail of hydrology, to be able to lay a, a, an object down the course of a stream and in every meter of that um, object measure the exact height of water above that and see the changes in water height on re with resolution on the order of seconds. This is quite exciting. It looks as if this will be a reality maybe not next year, but in the, in the not-so-distant future. Right now, they're able to measure um, pressures at, at, at on the order of 10 meters of, of waterhead quite easily, and one meter of waterhead looks like it's coming very soon, and 10 centimeters seems is physically feasible. But to avoid the complexity of, of having to, bring, to isolate pressure from temperature, we're going to use what we call Raman scattering, and there's a, there are other advantages as well to Raman scattering. Raman scattering is fundamentally the light, it's due to the light interaction with the, um, the, the electrons in the, in the glass, and so you can either give energy to the electrons or get a little bit of energy from electrons depending on their energetic state, and so you get the Stokes and anti-Stokes peaks off the center line frequency. It turns out that the anti-Stokes peak is much more sensitive to changes in temperature than the Stokes peak. And so by taking the ratio of these two, we can get a signal which is essentially independent of the initial intensity of light and only proportional to temperature. And that's, a very, um, that's what we're really talking about. Now what we're going to do is shine a pulse, put a pulse of light down this fiber, and then we'll look at these these returning um, backscattered light, and we're going to parse them out in time. And so each nanosecond or less, we will take an individual measurement of this ratio. And each of those measurements then relates to a, a known position down the fiber due to the time of travel. That's, that's called time domain reflectometry, optical time domain reflectometry, if you will. And so in other words, this is how we get our spatial resolution down the fiber. Now, we should be clear that um, this is a, a st statistical measurement. That is to say, we count up how many photons were shifted 
towards the higher frequency and how many were shifted towards the lower frequency. And they, the computed value of that ratio will have a precision that's proportional to the square root of that number of photons. So fundamentally, we'll see then that the longer integration times give us more and more precision. And so when we quote the precision of this instrument, you should always expect to know how long was the integration time that was used to get that measurement. So a very quick snapshot will have a lower temperature precision, and a longer integration will have a, a higher precision. OK. So some of the current specifications, um, the Brion instruments right now are running about $100,000. Um, the precision is on the order of 500th of a degree. Um, because the um, acoustic properties of the fiber are much more sensitive uh, to chemistry than are the um, optical uh, backscatter properties, the cable-specific calibration is much more um, important uh, on the um, Brion scattering. You use what's called a single mode fiber, which you don't need to know anything about besides the fact that it, the signals disperse much more slowly and have, are attenuated more slowly, so therefore you can take a longer, uh, a longer uh, uh, fiber. You can measure it down a longer fiber. The spatial resolution on the order of one meter. The Raman devices, which I'm going to talk about today, they've been dropping in price quite dramatically. I, would, I don't know the exact numbers, but in 2003, 2004, this was probably on the order of 500,000 to a million. 2005, it was on the order of 100,000. And now we're talking about instruments that are in the more $30,000 range. The current precision um, many producers are quoting is about a hundredth of a degree C. There is cable-specific calibration. And what we're learning, uh, moreover than just cable specific calibration, there's a little bit of installation specific calibration. That is, if you bend the cable very sharply or if you have a rock resting on it, then that can create a situation where one of those, uh, the, the stokes or anti-stokes, might escape the fiber preferentially to the other. And that's what's called differential attenuation. And so typically when you do an installation, you have to assess the, the um, differential attenuation. It is in some sense not a, a, a cable specific uh, calibration in that you, it's a, you simply do the measurement at the beginning of your test and you identify that attenuation and then that's a one time deal. So it's not, it, it can be done without um, an extensive laboratory temperature study. But there are some cable specific calibrations that should go on when you, when you install this. So don't, it's not complete plug and play, although it's quite close. We use a multi-mode fiber. Um, this is because we need a whole lot of light going down that fiber. And these multi-mode fibers are good for under 10 kilometers. Now, some manufacturers um, are, are quoting uh, 18 kilometers with the same technology. Uh, so apparently, this is not a hard number uh, but, uh, on this order. The spatial resolution, right now, commercial instruments are generally between a half a meter and two meters. Um, there have been pr instruments produced which have resolution down to three centimeters. Um, and so there's no fundamental physical uh, limitation here, except for the speed of the electronics, the speed of the optics, and then the, dis the dispersion down the fiber. So as you go down the fiber, this, this pulse, which was, which was initially sharp, is dispersing, and that limits your spatial resolution. So after about a kilometer, a one meter is about as well as you'll do. After two kilometers, about 1.2 meters, and so on. And so when you get to five and 10 kilometers, really, you shouldn't expect to have any better than two meter spatial resolution. Let's just look at a few applications of these fiber optics. And many of you may have seen these articles, these data presented in the Water Sources Research article that came out in December, or the um, Geophysical Review Letters article that came out in December as well. So you can look there for some more details. Um, one of our first uh, experiments, well, really what motivated this particular um, set of experiments was the um, desire to see at high spatial resolution the thermal profile in a snowpack over a glacier. And so this t was done with uh, Mark Parlange's team uh, and Scott Tyler, and uh, with uh, especially um, working closely with Hendrik Huwald, who is a postdoc in, the, in Parlange's lab. Um, we had a bunch of other instruments out there. Um, we were trying to get the energy balance for the snow system. And we were also, um, I'm very interested in understanding how high frequency um, pressure fluctuations in the, uh, due to fluctuations in wind speed, um, uh, express themselves in as pulses of energy into the snow. And so uh, co with the temperature study, there were a whole bunch of other measurements. Here's the, the basic strategy. We needed um, less than, we needed sub-centimeter uh, resolution. And so since our instrument would only read one measurement per, uh, per meter, 
the way to collapse those measurements down was to simply wrap the fiber around a, a, a very, very thin walled PVC tube. And so we're using a 900 micron, so it's just under a, a millimeter diameter fiber that's been wrapped on this lathe. And so it gives us one meter of fiber every four millimeters of vertical length. And so it gives us your basic kind of four millimeter resolution about this device. And to compare this to some other measurements, and it turns out that measuring snow temperature is not easy. Um, it, we made a, a thermocouple probe where we have 80 thermocouples installed. Each one of these thermocouples comes out and then wraps around the outside of this probe to thermally isolate it from the inner column of thermocouples. This is a thick-walled, uh, low thermal conductivity plastic. And this could be used to then pounded into the snowpack as well. And uh, this is Scott Tyler and Olivier um, following the the, uh, the snowcat out to the site here at 3,000 meters elevation in Switzerland on the Plan Mort. And uh, great thanks should go to uh, Mark Parlant, who, who did a tremendous amount of work getting this whole um, possibility arranged. Here's, uh, I think this, is this Mark or, 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 uh, or Scott? I think that's Mark. Um, kind of adjusting, uh, while we put in the pressure print sensing probes, and these are what we're looking at the high pressure fluctuations um, of air in the snow. And then back in this area, this was later built up to be the full weather station. Um, and right back here were installed the fiber optic and the uh, thermocouple probes. And here we have an array of sonic anemometers. And so here is uh, we, the first conclusion you're going to see is that snow, the measurement of temperature in snow is difficult. Um, and what we have here are the dotted lines of the thermocouple and the solid lines of the fiber optic. And both of them at the snow interface have a very rapid transition. You'll see that the thermocouple um, sensors were somewhat uh, uh, dispersed compared to the sharper um, change in temperature due to the, the, um, the fiber optics. And that's because that big core, we think it's because that big core of, um, of copper that goes down that through all those thermocouple wires was actually conducting a little bit of heat and, and, and kind of um, melding the temperatures a bit. We had some real issues with respect to solar gain above this. It was extraordinarily bright and very sunny during this period, um, so solar gain is a big issue. We've since uh, put uh, solar shields on the system, and we should have some data just taken here in February um, for the next. This is from uh, 2006. The 2007 data um, look a lot better, and we're just working those up. Um, since we had that um, probe made, we also wondered what else we could do with a high-resolution vertical uh, temperature sounding probe. And so we thought about going to Lake Geneva and looking at, can we quantify the air-water energetic exchange by seeing extremely high-resolution temperature profiles above and below the, the, the surface of the lake? This work was um, done, with, again, with uh, Mark Parlange's team, uh, Ellie Boussy, Hendrick, um, Ulrich Lemon, a professor at EPFL, and Mark. Um, and what we were really trying to do is see how well we can measure that interfacial transition. And uh, this is actually after the fact uh, when I'm pulling the probe out. Uh, we, uh, when I put this in, uh, lightning was striking just up uh, about 20 kilometers up on Lake Geneva. Um, and it is interesting. One of the things you learn when you go into new environments um, is the importance of, 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 of outlier events. We had a very big storm, which happened to wash tree trunks down the, the stream very close to us, and those tree trunks then uh, found their way to our probe. But before that happened. Um, we had these uh, data, and it's a little bit difficult to read. The slide resolution uh, is not improved by going nationally with this. But um, basically, this is what the profile looked like at 4 o'clock. So the air temperature was right around 15 degrees, and it came right down and, and had a water temperature here of about 11 degrees. And then as that storm moved in, we can see the profiles of temperature. Um, and these two, one was taken at 4.41 p.m., and this one was taken at 4.42 p.m. These traces, uh, the, 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 all the traces except for the, the two solid lines, are 15-second integrations. And so you'll see the variance of the data is about a tenth of a degree C. So that shorter resolution, that 15-second resolution, means that we have a little bit more noise in the data, as we talked about earlier. On the other hand, when I take one-minute um, integrations, you can start to see that we have a, a significant reduction in the noise. Interestingly, as that storm came in, the temperature changed very, very quickly. And so this is w separating by one minute. We saw a quarter of a degree or more uh, change in the air temperature. Um, looking closely at the surface, we can very clearly see the kind of log profile um, temperature that allows us to compute the, uh, the energy exchange across the air-water interface. 
Um, this is a blow up of this section right in here. And then it, it kind of lots of curious stuff here. But one of the things that was a bit more uh, a bit unexpected for me was that the, the air temperature transition happened um, right around the four to five o'clock period. But the water temperature transition, actually, this red here is about 8.30. And so between 8 and 9, the water um, column uh, changed its temperature. And we don't know exactly what happened here, but we think that perhaps the air, the high velocity air was starting to push, uh, to mix and push colder water into the, into the shoreline. But in any case, what we see is extremely high resolution, four millimeter resolution vertical profiles in both the water and the air. This is the, the next year's installation of it. This was done in August of 06, and we're preparing for yet another installation. Here, of course, we're at, we've made a, a longer pole. Uh, we've tried to do a, a rudimentary job of, of solar protection, and the reason we're going to try to go back out there is to do a better job of solar protection if we really want to get the 24-7 um, high accuracy measurements. And then we've coupled this with LICOR and, uh, and ecovariance measurements to be able to um, see if we can, quanti we can do the entire energy balance for the system. And then there's also other, there's a secondary temperature measurements uh, through thermocouples as well. Okay, so um, there's that, the high spatial resolution. Um, another uh, aspect of this that we want to, I want to emphasize is the high precision of the measurement and the ability to measure across large spatial scales. So uh, in the Czech Republic, I was uh, faced with some very interesting data a couple of years ago where they seem to be seeing some abrupt temperature transitions at great depth within these um, abandoned mine shafts. These are man mine shafts are water-filled. And so working with the team of Martin Stetzal and Joseph Lehman um, in uh, the University of Brno and also Scott Tyler and David Lockington, um, we've been looking a little bit at these, uh, looking more closely at these, these shafts. This is the setting, so we have a, an old coal mine um, that it, uh, the works are, have been abandoned um, for about the last 10 years. And uh, these are my colleagues, Martin and Joseph, and the landscape around it. This mine shaft, if, if you don't know this, but right over here, there's another mine shaft that's connected with a lateral intersect. So this is not just a simple one shaft uh, system, but actually has a complex set of inter interconnect. And I'll point out a little bit where those occur in the data. This the cable going down the, the mine shaft. This hole, um, less than a meter, uh, goes down um, 1,400 meters, so roughly one mile straight down. Uh, so this is the setting. We have the, we have the fiber going down the hole, and here's the DTS system. This fiber is a stainless steel wrapped uh, fiber that's good to very high pressure. The fiber optic is is contained inside of a, a capillary tube that's also welded stainless steel. So here's a, a look at the data. Um, going from the surface, we have an air field, 120 or so, 130 meters. We hit the water interface. The first 300 meters or so um, have a nice, uh, a simple uh, sloping uh, temperature. And then um, at right after 350 meters, I mean 450 meters, we have an abrupt change in temperature. Going back down again, we have a series of these steps in temperature. Now, the interconnects, the, the most important interconnects are here and up here. In this region, there are no interconnects. This is concrete lined um, uh, to, uh, shaft of six meters uh, in section. So just to give you a feeling for what the fiber optic can tell us, let's look at this little step here. And here we're going from 25.05 degrees to 24.65, so about a four-tenths of a degree change. And the variance, if you calculate the variance of adjacent points here, the variance is on the order of 700, uh, 7 thousandths of a degree, uh, standard deviation. So a standard deviation, excuse me. And in terms of spatial resolution, we're reporting the temperature um, every half meter, even though the, the, we know the resolution is on the order of a meter, the instrument allows us to report every half meter. And here you can see that over one meter, um, we see the bulk of the temperature change. And so the, the spatial resolution that we're seeing in the system is on the order of 1.2 to 1.3 meters, um, which is pretty much what well, we think. Of course, we don't know exactly how sharp that interface is. We suspect the interface is very sharp. But these um, temperature data were collected, were integrated over a 24-hour period. And so it could be that some of this was actual physical smearing due to small changes in the position of that interface. But anyway, quite remarkable in terms of being able to measure temperature um, to high uh, spatial and temporal, uh, spatial and temperature uh, precision. Now, kind of 
closer to the the heart of the classical hydrologist is to understand where streams come from. And uh, we all know that uh, the, the low flow, um, most streams uh, have a groundwater source that's uh, dominant. And it's interesting to see where the groundwater sources are. It's uh, we, we have certain tricks, remote sensing, uh, so forward looking infrared, and um, hobo sensors to get some idea of that. But what if we could um, see those um, every groundwater input? So what we're, now this is not a new thing, uh, using heat as a tracer in streams. I mean, there are, um, whole sessions have been devoted to this at GSA, um, many, many, many papers out there. So I'm not saying that the, that the techniques, any of the techniques by way of analysis um, are, uh, are novel. What is new is the tool. So the hundredth of a degree, although we'd like a thousand. Um, and here's that little calculation I gave you earlier about why a hundredth of a degree is important if we have a one percent uh, groundwater inflow. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the spatial resolution, we, we, we can know where the largest groundwater inflows are, but it's not that satisfying to not know that we haven't missed something. And so the idea is to have data every meter, so no missed um, sections of the stream. Um, we want to be able to look at scaling properties of our hydrologic systems, and so spanning um, one order of magnitude is, it, to me is not scaling. One order of magnitude is just you know, uh, is, is, is a local effect. We need to go at least two or three orders of magnitude to be able to really test our understanding of the scaling of these processes. And so we want to have on the order of a thousand-fold uh, scaling. And then the, the, uh, this instrument I haven't mentioned to this point, but because these um, instruments are using uh, standard communication lasers and personal computers, they are actually fairly low-power devices. And so. Um, Instruments on the market right now draw anywhere from 30 to 200 watts, um, and so many of them are quite practicable to power on solar panels. So it makes a lot of sense to, to, for a field instrument. So this is the site where we'll, um, we'll be showing data from. It's um, the Meisbeek River in Luxembourg. Um, Nick van de Giesen is a key collaborator here, John F Jan Friesen. Um, Martin Westhoff is not shown, but a, a key collaborator as well. Julia Selker and Jordan Selker, of course, uh, instrumental in most of the theoretical contributions. Um, and then uh, we've, it's a beautiful location. You wouldn't think of Luxembourg as rural, but there's tremendous variety and richness in the rural environment there. This is the um, near the head of the stream uh, where we have a gauging station. Of course, the, the fiber, when you have no water, it's hard to put the fiber in the water. So you will occasionally see um, in the data where the fiber came out of the water. In general, we have to do filtering to pull out those data points. This is that same stainless steel fiber, V-notch weir. Uh, there is Martin Westhoff uh, putting in yet a different cable uh, that we put in uh, in November of, of last year. And um, putting the cables in is fun, um, so everyone uh, should visit the inside of a culvert at once in their life. The uh, basic uh, uh, setting of our study, these are the headwaters up here. There's a bunch of little seeps in this, in this um, kind of uh, um, small concave valley, and then it comes out in this little stream. About midway through this uh, valley, you can see there's nice tree cover. We were in a, in a period of time when it wasn't, the leaf, leafing was not out, um, so much of it was sun exposed. A lot of blackberries, uh, a lot of torn up um, skin. Uh, there's some blackberries we had to thrash our way through. Um, somewhat incised in locations, uh, coming down to a, a bedrock in many places. Not a lot of hyperic exchange here. And um, if we want to get the temperature of a groundwater or the volume of groundwater, we need to look at equations and unknowns. So uh, going above and below a groundwater input, what we'll see is a transition in temperature. So what affects that is the flow of groundwater into the system and the temperature of that groundwater, as well as the, inf the incoming flow. So we have um, three things we need to know, we'd like to know. The incoming flow, we have to measure. So we have to know what's coming in. And then if we can measure, the, if we assume that the stream and groundwater flows are relatively constant over short time intervals, for instance, between 4 in the afternoon and 4 in the morning, then we may well, as we did here, get two very different temperatures of the influent water versus the outgoing water. And so our two, un our two remaining unknowns are the temperature and quantity of groundwater. Well, we have two equations that depend on the temperature and quantity of groundwater. And so this is upstream and downstream right around surrounding this groundwater inflow. 
And you can see that this all happens in, of course, of just a couple of meters. If we want to look at more data points, perhaps several million, um, we can take that and we can take all the data that we collected from that fiber in time on the vertical axis here, going for a little over a week. In space, this is going down the stream, and we can see that the, the warm colors here correspond to when it was sunny out, and the cool colors are nighttime or when it was cloudy. And we see these groundwater inflows are represented by abrupt changes from either warm to cold, or in fact, from cold to warmer. So we see um, the effect of each of these groundwater inflows. Based on this sort of uh, analysis, we can then start to assess the quantity of groundwater, groundwater coming into each of these uh, in each of these sources and construct the kind of the Napoleonic invasion of, of, of Russia diagram showing where the water's coming into the system. And then if we you know we can clearly take averages and watch the diurnal fluctuation of the overall system. Mm -hmm. Here we can look a little bit more at the real um, kind of nidoscritus, if you will, of the system. And this, these are, are I think, three-minute shots. And so you can start to see the variance on a three-minute shot is pretty fine. These are two and a half degrees. And these are giving us variances on the order of three hundredths of a degree. So really nice, clean data. This is where we are going over a, an exposed rock section. So lots of, uh, of, of air. The cable's hitting lots of air. This is pre-filtering for these things. Kind of an interesting little sidelight is that you have a wet fiber which cools in the air, and then a, a dry fiber which warms in the air, and you actually could get the wet bulb uh, relative humidity is that way, although I don't think they'd be the most accurate. We have islands in the river that give interesting little um, uh, uh, indications on the, on the cable temperature. We have warming on a sunny day as it's going down, down slope, and then cooling at night. And then you can see here where we start to get uh, a cooling here and a warming here. So right in the middle, we would have that, that no change groundwater temperature. And where there is no change above and below groundwater source, we also then know the source temperature as well. So that's another uh, method of getting the groundwater temperature if you happen to be so lucky as to cross the groundwater temperature with the system. These, uh, there are confluences here. So we have a large confluence here where, we're, where our, our stream was joining another stream, and then a, a, a much larger confluence here where we join a very, well, that, the stream that you saw in the first photograph. Some, you know, kind of expected but interesting behavior is the change in temperature between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. as the sun goes down in the small streams is quite dramatic, and of course in the large stream, much uh, subdued. And then equally in the middle of the night, uh, between 1 a.m. and 7 a.m., the small streams have already attained their coolest temperatures, but the large stream is still cooling down. So a lot of cool, you know, just uh, you know, any number of really cool things to watch. And we can do a, a model of this, uh, the heat exchange and get all the um, energetic terms and then uh, go ahead and simulate it. And unfortunately, we can't run this movie um, on the uh, live here, but this is, um, we can check our numerical model against all the temperature as measured in this stream and watch it in a movie form. And so it, it's really kind of spiffy to be able to, to take all those data. And it constrains our physical model greatly. You see where you're missing things. You see where you didn't account for the hyperic exchange. We are doing the same work here in Oregon. Uh, this is in the H.J. Andrews uh, Long-Term Experimental Research Site. Um, and here we're putting in a fiber optic, weighting it down with, uh, with rebar into this uh, very fast-moving uh, stream. And here's the, the cable on its spool. So you see, you see this classic spool effect, we call it, where it's hotter and colder on different parts of the spool. And then here it dips into the creek and lots of interesting behavior in the creek. Now, <clears throat> beyond just taking the temperature of, of um, as it's found, uh, we could also uh, use heat as a tracer in an active sense. And so we can make a little heat machine where we uh, have a backpack-mounted water heater with a gas supply and a pump and a little data logger, and it tells us how much heat we're putting in the stream. And then we might be able to then watch that heat pulse go down the stream, not at one or two points, but rather at literally hundreds of points. And so. Uh, most tracers we put in and we watch them at, at, at selected points at very low uh, temporal resolution. Here we can watch them at very many points at very high temporal resolution. So it gives a whole new opportunity to constrain our models again. And you can go through the, uh, the calculations of heat exchange and see that about an 8 kilowatt um, system that would run for hours with a 11 pounds of propane, so we can do that. And um, the heat exchange would be about one square meter of heat exchanger, which is about the size of a little radiator used on an automatic transmission cooling system. 
So, in other words, uh, this looks like a pretty feasible thing. People have also talked about using ice and for a, as a cold source. Okay, <clears throat> so what we've talked about thus far then is uh, the uh, fiber optic method and temperature, but there's a whole lot of complementary technologies that are, uh, I think, quite exciting. One of them is uh, one of the efforts that's going on at, in Switzerland that I worked on a lot uh, while in sabbatical was this open source networks for distributed sensing, and we call it uh, uh, SensorScope. So we had a team that, uh, a bunch of Swiss who had, had actually never done machining, which I think is rare among the Swiss. But anyway, they, uh, and so we went to a machine shop and chopped up literally thousands of pieces of, of aluminum to make 110 of these stations. The idea is that we're using these moats, uh, which are just basically little data loggers with radios attached to them and a lot of very complex software to drive it all. And so we all know that radios and, and, and data loggers are, are very small and very low power. And so how can we use that? And um, <clears throat> our goals were then uh, to get high temporal and spatial resolution, as we talked about before, at a reasonable price under $1,000. It should be a turnkey solution, not just with sensors, but also <clears throat> with all the power and database and communications parts, so the web source on there. The problem is that many of the tools we're looking at, um, yeah, it's all feasible if you had an electrical engineer or a computer scientist working with you. And so far, many people are making those relationships. But in fact, I claim it's a waste of time. It's, yeah, it's a community. We need, as a community, to get much more organized. And that's one of the places where HMF uh, really should be playing a, a big role, and I hope it will. And here's the basics of our system. It had a power board and a solar cell and a little um, interface where we had nine sensors, um, echo probes, and things like that. Um, so yeah, we did. Here's all the sensors: temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation, rainfall, etc. And you can go to the web. Just Google it. You can look at our map, see all the cool sites where we have our stations. You can see little pictures of them. You can then look at, if you want, you can download the data. Take all the data you like. Um, just click on that, what you prefer to see. Maybe you want to draw a picture of it first, so you can click the data you want to plot, and then you can get a plot of the data, say if that's exciting to you or not. Um, it's valuable to inspect the data. Not all sensors work all the time. And so you can look and see that there are some sensors that didn't work right there. So maybe you don't want to get station number 13. Um, no uh, idea of that coincidence in the number. But anyway, um, so. What, so these distributed sensing networks, I think, are going to complement certainly the fiber optics, but moreover, it's another very powerful tool to uh, address our interest in um, understanding the processes that are, are hydrologically important, and particularly the scaling relationships um, in those variables. Now, there are a lot of other cool instruments out there, and the HMF uh, really is is strongly pushing to get all these tools into everyone's hands. One of them, for instance, is a laser spectrometer. It's called a ring-down spectrometer sometimes. And basically, you take a, a laser light, and you put it into a cavity, and you let it bounce back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you see, you see which frequencies of light get absorbed. So you scan the frequencies. And in that way, you can get the isotopic composition of a gas sample. For instance, the isotopic composition of a, of a of water vapor that you just evaporated having pulled up from a stream. In principle, these measurements should be on the order of seconds. And so right now it's still minutes or longer, but um, the instruments are on the order of twenty to $30,000. Um, data with resolution of seconds or minutes would, I think, transform our ability to isolate evaporative um, and groundwater sources and all sorts of different uh, components of the hydrologic cycle. There's On the cool, cheap side, there's some really neat stuff. As you may have noticed in your house, uh, there's all sorts of sensors for different gas that you might be afraid of, methane, carbon monoxide, etc. There's all sorts of microscopic sensors for temperature and relative humidity. They're getting incredibly cheap. Many of these require either no power, they're self-powering, or extraordinarily small amounts of power. Here's an example I wanted to, uh, to show of, uh, of in situ gas tracing. So wouldn't it be cool to know how the gas exactly was moving underground without taking a bunch of samples? And we, we did this taking a bunch of samples approach. This is Scott Tyler warming his hands at about minus 25 degrees C. Here's our little probes. We're looking, we're injecting carbon monoxide and we're looking at its breakthrough. And so here, I've, in blue arrows, I've, we did the injections on different points, and it's just going to show them very briefly. But we made injections, and then these are the breakthrough curves that follow those injections. So this is half a meter away from the point of injection. Here's another one, half a meter away. And you can see at each different depth of measurement how those curves came out. 
and some of these, uh, this was injected at this probe, and then this is picking up the injection from the other probes. So we can do in situ high temporal resolution, high spatial resolution measurements of, of gas transport um, at quite low cost, which I think will reveal a lot of things about how the, um, the transport processes in the subsurface go. There are lots of other measurement devices. If you need to have the temperature of something, don't buy it from Campbell. Go ahead and get a Zytemp uh, thermal infrared for 10 bucks. Uh, and this is fully signal conditioned. You can either get voltage or serial output. If you want to know everything, maybe this uh, 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 via solar sensor, which gives rainfall rate, wind speed and direction, relative humidity and temperature, all in one package would be exciting for you. And LIDARs, and these incredible little ultra-precise uh, pressure sensors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the ways we're going to get these in your hands is this hydrologic measurement facility. And it, we're really off the blocks. Uh, our goal is to facilitate hydrologic discovery. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of stuff, surveys, white papers, meetings. We've got a geophysics node that is up and running and, and, and serving people. Uh, I think many people on our, uh, our, our call today are being served by this. We're also, this is the first kind of official perhaps mention of it, we're putting out a special issue of water sources. Well, we'll put out a special section of water sources research on hydrologic measurement methods. And that's been very broadly uh, um, called for uh, you know, in terms of anything you want, any way of measuring you're interested in is, is welcome. Ty Foray will be leading this up. We've got a wonderful team of people working on this. Um, Brett working on biogeochemistry, Jennifer working on the water cycle, Ty working on instrumentation and measurement, Rosemary on, on geophysics, and Rick, uh, our loyal uh, lead, uh, uh, liaison to Quasi. So lots of stuff happening there. So to sum up then, um, how do we play high tech? Well, in my opinion, what we do is first dream. Assume it can be done. There are some things that can't be done, but many, 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 maybe the majority of things that you dream up can be done. Then clearly define your measurement needs, what temporal, spatial, precision, accuracy, all those aspects that would be required to, to um, test your hypothesis. At this point, partnering with a specialist, I think, is often obligatory. Many of these sensors have interferences, and since we're, we're trying new things out, we need to be humble to the fact that we have to do a lot of learning about how these things really work and what the data really mean. So partnering with a specialist is, is a good thing. I will say that in electrical engineering now, many of the straight-up electrical engineering problems are solved. And there's a great interest among electrical engineers and computer engineers to work on applications which are novel. And what we're doing often involves nanotechnology, sensors, et cetera, and they're generally very excited to work with you. And I think it's, very, it's critical to, uh, to take the time to understand the basic chemistry and physics of the problems so you understand what the limitations of your method might be. So my summary is then that uh, we see that fiber optic uh, temperature could be transformative, changing the way we see where water is and what's going on in that water. And I encourage you then to not just think of what you've done in the past, but think of what could be done and think of what, and moreover, think about what should be done and let that be your guide. And uh, I strongly believe that uh, Kwasi um, and the HMF are trying the very best they can to um, make this happen um, as broadly as possible. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. So John, thanks very much for, a, as always, great talk. And I guess, Karma, we can open up the lines, and I'd also like to facilitate questions online so I can moderate that. But for folks who want to ask a question on the phone, it's star one, is that right? Yes, it is. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question, please press star one on your touchstone telephone. If the question has been answered or you wish to withdraw your question, please press star two. Questions will be taken in the order received. Please press star one to begin. And we'll wait one moment while questions compile. And again, ladies and gentlemen, it is star one to ask a question. So, John, I've, I've got a quick question for you. Um, as we were talking before we started here, there's a great interest in trying to systematically share a lot of this information. Um, it's probably going to happen at a frequency that could be um, higher than a WRR session will allow for. How can the HMF best share this information with folks who just want to go out and buy a sensor for you know temperature or humidity or a new range? 
Well, good question, John. I mean, we see two basic issues. One of them is just sharing practical, pragmatic uh, lessons, and that I think, and I've long thought, should be done as a wiki, uh, either in Wikipedia or other places. Uh, Teresa Bloom uh, in Potsdam, Germany, has put together a, a wiki for instrumentation, uh, hydraulic instrumentation. We have a little wiki going, not much um, put on to it yet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have Teresa handle that. But I think there has to be this dynamic, kind of um, the big eye of, of the world adding to uh, the, the conversation. And I think that's going to be a significant component of this. The peer-reviewed side is still important. I mean, bottom line is that if you're going to get funding to do a scientific study, you have to use uh, validated and peer-reviewed methods. Um, and so, or at least show how you're related to those methods. And so we really believe that the WRR um, type of publication is still critical. But indeed, uh, it could be that the most important information that gets people going will be um, on much more of a wiki sort of in, um, interface. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think the survey clearly showed that everyone really believes that this some special edition, a peer-reviewed uh, source for these methods is, is exactly what we need. So depending on what's going on on the, the phones, David Maidman has a question in the chat box. The Waters Network, for those of you who may not know, Waters is a joint proposed uh, initiative through National Science Foundation between the hydrologic scientists and environmental engineering communities for long-term environmental observatories. And they're concerned with measuring nitrogen. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, it, it's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and when I say, you know, dream and, and many of the things that uh, that you can uh, that you can think of uh, are possible, um, I must say that uh, the one that, that that is always asked is, is nitrate and nitrogen, uh, and and that is a tough one. And one of the things I think uh, is. Uh, is going to be the the real uh, issue, the, the the method that ultimately comes out is much like the oxygen sensor that has just come out that's over the last few years, which is an optical method. And basically, in that case, you're sending out a, a much like the well, the same sense as the um, the laser spectrometer. You send out a certain frequency of light that you know that um, that oxygen preferentially absorbs, and you look at the backscattered light. And then you can. The beauty of it is you can um, you can ratio that with a non-absorbed frequency and get rid of things such as um, fouling of the of the um, optics. And so that has play, has uh, I think transformed our ability to measure oxygen contents of water bodies. And my guess is that we'll have something like that in nitrogen in the not too distant future. Although um, I can't say that I know anything of the specifics of such a development. I'm going to follow up to that. Anything about measuring bacteria in water? Um, colloidals. Um, well, you know, uh, that's. Uh, I, I tend to, again, think optically as a, as a first line of defense if you want to have real time continuous. Um, other than that, I'm not, a, I'm not a good enough biologist to be able to give much uh, feedback on that. Okay. Um, and David, if you're out there and want to chat and follow up in person, star one. Utah State has got a question um, asking to talk a little bit more about SensorScope, the sensor yeah. to base stations database to web flow of data. Exactly. Well, go look at it uh, is the first thing, and, and you'll see that it, it, it's, uh, it, it works. Um, it, it, it's not a trivial thing to get this set up. And, and really, you correctly asked the question insofar as um, the sensors themselves are important, um, but it's the, it's the kind of the train of data that, that really is a complex uh, thing to organize. And that goes all the way between getting it from the sensor to the base station and onto the database. The idea is that uh, we, we wanted, the, uh, the objective of this project is, is to set up a sensing system that's going to span most of Switzerland and that will be a common structure for many of the science, environmental science uh, projects in Switzerland. And, um, and our goal, therefore, is to have a turnkey system where you'll be able to just grab the, the sensing package and take it to the field and hit go. And it turns out we're pretty close to that. If you look at the SensorScope site, you'll look and see that we did a, a brief installation on the glacier this year. And it was basically as we said. We just put out a base station, put out the stations, turned it on, and it started populating the database. So the team is, is working hard to make the database auto-configuring for the number of sensors that are out there. And then they've made a very nice web interface. So the idea is 
Yeah, it, it, we're, we, we talk about a sensor scope in a box, um, and so you, a basic set would be 10 stations, and it's just in one big box, and you get it, and you unpack it, and put it out, and let it rip, and you get um, the data. Eventually, uh, and, the, and the, well, the, the data will, will be in a common format, and so that maybe helps a lot of the HIST type people who say, how are you going to, you know, metadata and all that stuff. It, that's the beauty of having a, a, a one team or one group be developing these databases and stuff, is that you'll have a common format, common um, structures uh, that will make it much easier for there to be uh, cross, uh, cross project collaboration. And the ballpark price is much lower than conventional methods, obviously, as well. Yeah, we, the, we, we, on our first go, making 100 of them, 110, um, we were under $1,000 each. Um, and I, in the second go, um, my hope is to be under 500. Um, and the other thing is that the number of sensors out there is really exciting. Snow depth sensors, for instance, um, a big deal in Switzerland. We just came across an uh, ultrasonic snow de uh, depth sensor that's good to an inch and have, has a 20-foot uh, dynamic range, so meters, you know, good to two, ce two centimeters with a six-meter range. And, um, and that's $20. They're using it off the side of barges right now to tell how high the barge is floating off the water. It's a very robust system, and we anticipate that that will be one new sensor we put on there. But there are just a world of sensors that are low cost and tell us things that we care about. Good deal. Before we go to uh, David's next question, uh, Karma, are there any questions on the line? Yeah, we have no questions on the line, sir. Okay. So you mentioned a bit just now, John, but how can HIS and HMF work more together? Well, uh, it seems like sharing uh, the data format for sensor scope uh, with HIS as well as these different types of outputs. Well, I think that... Um, we just uh, we're, the, the HMF is is, is a little bit uh, behind in the development uh, where the HIS is, but one of the things that we're just finalizing now is what we call a governance document that controls um, what the data requirements and the reporting requirements are for people who um, work with HMF. And there are, the HMF is going to be structured in these nodes where people, specialists in particular technologies, get funding to um, to to get new equipment and to share that equipment and expertise with the community. There will then be fair use policies that say, if you collect data using this, this community equipment, then you get a certain period of time where, you, where it's your data, and then it must be published. And so with QA, QC, and whatnot. And so each of those nodes then will be coming up with its metadata that w best describes the, uh, the activity that it is responsible for. So much of the, you know, it doesn't make it easier for the HIS, but it, um, it makes it perhaps easier for, um, for the HMF, is that the, each of these nodes will be somewhat independent in this sense, up to the point of having to comply with the governance. But each one will um, develop its own, uh, its own uh, metadata and uh, data standards. And so in that process, the HMF will have to play a supervising role assuring that they've um, attended to making that data available, ideally directly through the H HIS. I'll just add to that quickly. I think to some extent it's going to depend on what HMF activities we're talking about. So, for instance, uh, as John mentioned, the geophysics node is up and going and data is being collected. That's going to be made available uh, for the portions that, that Tawazi is directly responsible for collecting. But there's other things. Um, where is this great grassroots type of, of activity that's going on in the hydrogeophysics community right now where people are willing to loan equipment and get other sorts of data? So that, you know, it's we're not going to be um, as concerned about the provenance of the data itself. We just submitted a proposal. It was in the recent Kawazi newsletter um, for the, the water cycle. It's basically uh, land surface atmosphere interactions and Eddie Koflux Towers and really trying to nail down um, evapotranspiration in a, in a much more rigorous way. So that was a proposal that uh, Jennifer Jacobs and, and Hank Locher spearheaded. In that, we're saying that there's going to be a direct link and you know that data will be shipped over and HIS will have copies of it. So I think it's really going to depend on what we're talking about with HIS. Hey, one thing that I forgot to mention uh, earlier, and that is that the HMF is putting on workshops, and one of the workshops between September 10th and 14th, mark your calendars, um, is going to be on fiber optic temperature measurement. And so that will be at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest. 
Um, it's put on uh, with uh, USGS and uh, Scott uh, Tyler as well. Um, it's going to be limited to 20 or so participants. Um, so uh, the announcement will be coming out in various venues in the coming two weeks. Um, but if you're interested in doing that, you can contact me for the preliminary program. But that's, again, September 10th through 14th. So if you want to learn more about the specific fiber optic technology, that's an opportunity as well. Good plug. Utah State has uh, another follow-up to the sensor scope. Can some of those ideas become part of HIS and vice versa? So um, the Utah State folks, if you want to hop online and... Yeah, I mean, um, boy, I hope so. I mean, I, I really, um, the last thing I intended to do when I, I devoted a lot of time to SensorScope was develop something that was just for Switzerland. Um, really, I was developing that for the HMF in my, in my own mind. Um, and the, I would love to um, have the HIS uh, take part in this, um, and uh, I, I, I'll extend an open invitation to talk about that and to have you come over to Switzerland. Um, I'll be there uh, this uh, July and August, and so um, if anyone wants to, 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 to work with us um, from the HIS, that's, that'd be delightful. And I know that from the water side of things, uh, Chuck Haas, who is on the, the Waters Project Office uh, leadership team, heard about SensorScope, and I get, had a talk at Drexel University where, where he's a professor, mm -hmm. and so this has bubbled up in a number of different ways. Well, the idea, the, the, the present plan is in November of this year to um, put out our, our second uh, our second version of the stations, and uh, and so um, and right around that period we'll be starting to put out an open call for who would like to have stations, and so we're trying to define a price point, um, and so that we can basically say, okay, who all wants these, and we're going to try to go public. Um, now it's it's a it's it, it's fraught with with scary things. I mean, we don't want to be a manufacturer, right. but um, so we're trying to make relationships with manufacturers and stuff. But the idea was that around November of this of this year, we'd be putting out a call, and maybe even re we'll see how efficient we are putting out the call, and then and, and then um, filling that call um, in the following month, so that we can have the sensor scope in a box available to the whole world. So I've got a follow-up to that. Has anyone involved in the SensorScope team interacted at all with the folks out at SENS, the Center for Embedded Network Sensing at yeah. UCLA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've uh, talked to them. I, I mean, had, I've had personal conversations at, at length um, with Dr. Estrin. And, uh, and I, uh, yeah, they, there is an interesting... And and, and 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 she actually was on a a, 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 thesis com a PhD committee and visited the EPFL and saw the sensor scope. Uh, the, the Center for Embedded Systems they really kind of are National Science Foundation funded and they are saying we have to do research on these embedded right. systems. And what we're saying is yeah you have you know but we we're trying to the HMS kind of feeling is we're trying to provide tools. Right. And, and so they're saying, well, let the commercial sector do that, the private sector. And unfortunately, the private sector is not doing what we want them to do, which is not a big surprise. Ultimately, the private sector might you know, be successful at, at, at putting out systems that would be useful for us. But right now, the prices aren't good, the functionality is not good, the web interface isn't good, um, all these things that, that we want. And, and so we've just moved, we need it now, and so we're putting it out. So um, the Center for Embedded Systems really is, is, is research focused, on the research on these embedded systems. And we don't care so much about that, although we have um, many researchers who are working with us who um, are putting papers out on our stuff in terms of multi-hop technology and stuff like that. But really our focus is getting the measurements. And so a little bit of a different focus. Yeah. So Karma, are there any questions online? Uh, it looks like David Maidman styled Star One. And again, ladies and gentlemen, is the Star One to ask a question? So I guess David Maidman has uh, wants to ask a question, Karma. If you could patch his line through. David, I'm not sure if you're on mute. Sure, so one one moment. Are you there, David? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good. Well, go ahead and, and fire away. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm asking the same thing, more or less, as what the Utah State people are, and that is that um, I think our capacity to archive observational data and serve it using web services and so on has matured to the point that there is a connect point here, that the same thing that they're saying I, I observe also. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we've managed to show that the 
population of data models can store um, physical and chemical and biological data and we've also got a fairly systematic way of serving that using web services so that it's very easy to get the data into applications. Mm -hmm. So the thing that would be different than what you're doing in the sensor scope is there would be a repository for the data um, that could handle large volumes of data, although I don't think you're talking about every millisecond or something like that. I mean, the, the more the derived data product, not the original, which I think might be a bit overwhelming. And, uh, and also for being able to say, you know, I want to get that to my application in some other location so that you don't have to fool around with ASCII files and that sort of stuff. Um, and Jeff Horsborough and David Tarbiton at Utah State University, and I assume one or other of those is what, what's referring to there is Utah State University have, have been the lead people on that and they've got some real time data stuff being done in the Bear River watershed in Utah mm -hmm. and so one of the questions that came up yesterday <laughs> okay so it's David Tarleton here uh, one of the questions that came up in the Waters Network discussion yesterday that we had was the project PIs was and Doug James raised this was what about real time data and can your system handle real time data and I think it would be real positive from the quasi viewpoint if we could make a visible connection between the HMS effort and the HIS effort. You know, we could show here's something that HMS is doing and here's what HIS is doing and it doesn't bother me too much if it's not one of the official things, you know. Mm -hmm. But um well, I think yeah, that, um, you know, I think that'd be pretty very, very easy. I can give you the exact uh, people to talk to. We have uh programmers uh, in Switzerland who are just doing a database and uh, so basically they're putting up the data I think every 10 seconds or so it's, it's, it's high frequency um, and so then just porting it over to to your uh, as I understand your data structure perhaps uh, either the EPFL would be a data server for your your distributed system or or they could uh, um, we can port it over to your server. Can we uh, do this in Oregon? Do we have to do it in Switzerland? Well, I, I, I mean, the web is wide. Uh, in Oregon, I don't, I don't have a computer with the data on it, uh, so all the data is in uh, is in Switzerland on a server there. Um, but uh, look, Dave, why don't we talk offline on that? Um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to. to I would be love. I'd love to, to see this go forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's. I think one of the one of the things that's important here, uh, John, is. The concept of academic investigators collecting real-time data mm -hmm. and then filtering that and synthesizing it and archiving it and making it accessible to people, you know, along with all the other data sources that we're exploring in the HIS. Well, I mean, obviously, SensorScope is doing that right now. I mean, we, that's been on. We've got, I guess, about 10 gigabytes or so of data that's just constantly streaming in. Um, yes, any attitude, but yeah, I think it's great, and I'm happy to, to participate. One of the things about the 10 gigabytes we have is, although you say it may not be such a heavy load, they're talking about putting cameras on every one of these things, and then we're going to really talk about a lot more data, right? Um, so what they do will do an upward-looking camera that looks at a little uh, a, 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 a mirrorized dome, so it gives a 360 of the area, and, and it turns out that those images are quite informative. So um, there will be some heavier loading of our database um, quite quite soon. Yeah, I don't think we well we can talk about it offline, John. Yeah, <laughs> seems like it's it's a ripe opportunity, John. It, it seems like one of the it's a long hanging fruit, could certainly worthwhile to look at. Uh, Jamie is asking for clarification. Okay, answer this question, but the idea at some point to probably these answers to other researchers. Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Um, and now it's not. This is not an official part of HMF right now. This is a part of John Selker's work. Um, and moreover, uh, Mark Parlange and Martin Vetterly at EPFL. But as I say, the reason that I, I took part in this sensor scope development was I wanted to have a sensor scope in a box. And yes, that is the idea that, that late this year we hope to put out a call for people to say, who wants these things? How many stations do you want? And, and it's, it's not going to be infinite flexibility, but there will certainly be uh, sensor ports for soil moisture, wind speed, wind direction, infrared uh, temperature, solar radiation, um, r rainfall, um, snow depth, and what else is all built on there? But be, that's pretty much the oh, the, the, and soil matrix potential. So we use a, a, a little uh, um, watermark sensor. So those parameters are just the ones that are just ready to roll. 
And and so that will be the base set of parameters. We may add a few. Uh, there's some really cool new sensors that we may add on there. Um, but there will be a standard set that you can choose from, and then um, hopefully we'll be making those systems. Now, it, as I say, it, we're going to need to um, make some relationships with some producers in this um, step in this process. But we have the uh, the basic system is working, and uh, and we, that is the ultimate goal is to make it available to to people. And then the hope is that much, and I think this is where HIS and HMF really, or HMS, HIS and myself, maybe not HMF per se, but we need to sit down and talk because my hope is that part of the contract is you want these sensors, that's just great. And our fair use policy, my fair use policy is you just put the data online immediately and, and you get this, you get this, this wonderful price. And what we want to do is have starting to have a worldwide database that has a common instrumentation set or at least, um, you know, for, at starting with a common instrumentation set um, so that we can start to help researchers around the world get access to, to environmental data. And so that's really my goal is to have it be real time um, that everyone who participates and gets the advantages of SensorScope then contributes those data to the web and then gets to draw on all the other people who are using it. And then Jamie's pointing out, Jamie, if you're on the line and, and want to uh, talk, please hit star one. But, you know, she's pointing out that we've got 11 of these waters test bed projects that would be great candidates for these stations. Right. That's well, welcome back to your production issue. Right. Trying to get some sense of what the demand is. Yeah, well, that's um, great, Jamie. And I, I, um, I, I, this is a good point. We... Um, it's a, it's just a little bit scary yet. We're still uh, this is our goal, and and and, and you'll be hearing from us, um, and we should probably talk to you sooner than later so that we know what really you need to know and what the what the constraints are on your installations. Um, but I can tell you that um, this is our goal, and and my personal goal is that we'll have this um, set up with uh, um, at twenty dollars a pop, and we're right now going down hopefully one order of magnitude every year and a half. But I'm hoping that within three years we'll have basically a twenty dollars station, and then the sensors hanging off it maybe another two hundred, so kind of two hundred and fifty dollars instead of the five hundred. And so we're, we're heading down fast. But yeah, it's it, we'll, we can, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has offline um, by email as well. So it sounds like there's going to be more conference calls in the future as a as a result of this set of uh, Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it seems to be where life is going. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I know we're a quarter after and folks uh, probably have to get going. Any any other questions on the line, Karma? Yes, just questions, sir. Well, I, I want to just thank everyone for your your your, your stick with itness. Um, thanks for listening, and and please do feel free to contact me. And um, uh, it's a pretty darn exciting period of life we're going into uh, experimentally. Absolutely, and thanks a lot, John. So thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch about cyber seminars over the summer and next fall. Take care. This concludes your